I'm Larry Walther. This is PrinciplesofAccounting.com, Chapter 13. And in this module, we will be continuing our discussion of the accounting for bonds issued at a premium and discount using the straight line amortization method. And so recall from the previous module that we showed how if a company issued 108% five-year bonds when the market rate of interest was only 6%, that we would get a value of $108,000. $530. That would be the price received for the $100,000 face amount of bonds. We received a premium because these were 8% bonds when the market rate of interest was only 6%. They're superior in that sense. Again, we showed the calculations in the previous module and they're in the textbook as well. So let's think through this a little bit more. We're going to repay a total of $140,000. That's $4,000 every six months for five years and $100,000 at maturity. That is, we're going to repay $31,470 more than we borrowed. We borrow $108,530, the price we receive for the bonds. We repay over time a total of $140,000, a difference of $31,470. If we spread that difference over the 10 six-month periods, $31,470 divided by 10 is $3,147. So in essence, of the total cost of the borrowing, the difference between the cash in and the cash out, uh, we would assign expense of, under a straight line approach, $3,147 each period. That's different than the $4,000 cash payment we're going to make each period, however. So another way to consider this is to think about the interest expense could be computed by noting that the $40,000 of interest payment is offset or reduced by the premium. We got the $108,530 but only have to repay the $100,000 so we get to keep the $8,530. If we divide that $8,530 by 10 periods we would find that we are in essence amortizing $853 of the premium each period. That would result in a total amortization of the full premium of $8,530. And interest expense would be the difference between the $4,000 and the $853 premium amortization. Again, we come up with $3,147 as interest expense for each period. So let's look at journal entries. First of all, at issuance, we debit cash $108,530. That's the price of the bond. We're crediting bonds payable for the face amount $100,000. And the difference, the $8,530 goes into the premium on bonds payable account. Now, with each periodic interest payment of $4,000, hence the credit to cash, we're recording the calculated amount of interest expense of $3,147, and we're amortizing the premium or debiting or reducing the premium account by $853. That entry would be repeated every six months for the five-year period, so that by the end of the five years, the premium would be fully amortized or zeroed out, and we're then able to repay the bond, credit cash, $100,000, and debit bonds payable, $100,000. Here's a schedule. We start with a $100,000 bond and $8,530 of premium. So the total net book value of the bonds is $108,530. The first interest expense recording reduced the premium by $853, and it dropped the remaining premium to $7,677. The total net book value of the debt, $107,677 and then the interest expense, $3147. Again, $3147 plus the premium amortization equals the $4,000 actually paid. We'll continue that at each period. By the time we get to 2000X5, we will have completely amortized the premium and the bond has matured. Now, let's consider how bonds would appear on a balance sheet. Bonds payable are to be reported on the balance sheet as a liability along with the unamortized premium the premium is added to the bond payable account and also known as an adjunct account. Here we illustrate bonds payable $100,000 plus the unamortized premium at a particular date, $3,412. It was 2000X3 in the illustration. It's taken from that amortization table to get our total indebtedness of $103,412. The income statement for the year would include total interest expense of $6,294. That's $3,147 recorded twice during the year. This example uses straight line amortization method. The interest expense is uniformly recognized over the life of the bond. Uh, actually though, generally accepted accounting principles require the use of an effective interest method unless the straight line method does not give you a, a materially different result. The reason is very simple. With the straight line method, the interest expense is the same period each year, even though the debt is changing slightly each period through the amortization process. So the true effective interest cost is not 
pricing out at a constant percentage of the debt under the straight line method. In another module, when we look at the effective interest method, we'll see that we in fact have interest expense that is a constant percentage of the carrying value, the changing carrying value of the debt. For example, for a 2LX1 interest expense was 5.8% of the liability. If we were to divide the interest expense by the debt, that is 6,294 divided by a liability of 108,530. This changes by 2LX4, the interest expense is 6.1% of the debt. The 6,294 expense divided by a liability for the year of 103,412. So the effective interest method is a, is a more precise method and required under generally accepted accounting principles where, where the premium or discount is a material amount. This uh, spins around, we can look at the example under the discount. Uh, we'll assume the same facts except the market rate of interest was 10% and as was shown in a previous module and again repeated in the textbook, the price for such a bond would be $92,278. Again, we're repaying a total of $140,000. That's the $4,000 every six months for five years plus $100,000 in maturity. Uh, we're repaying $47,722 more than we borrowed. We repay $140,000 but we only borrowed 92278 So as you might imagine, the 47722 borrowing cost being spread over the 10 six-month periods would result in $4,722 of interest expense. That's different from the $4,000 payment we're going to be making. Interest expense is now going to be greater than the payment. Another way to consider this is to think that the interest cost could be calculated as the $4,000 payment plus the amortization of the discount, the $7,722 discount divided by 10 periods, would have periodic amortization of discount of $772. If we add that to the $4,000 cash payment, we'll get the total interest cost of $4,772. Looking at the journal entries, at the time of issuance, we'll debit cash the $92,278, the amount of cash we received. We'll credit bonds payable for its face amount $100,000 and the offsetting debit is to the discount on bonds payable, 7722 Each periodic interest payment will involve a credit to cash, 4000 a debit to the calculated amount of interest expense, 4772 and the difference is that periodic amortization of the discount credited to the discount account. At maturity, the discount would be fully amortized and we would repay the $100,000 credit cash and debit bonds payable. And so this gives rise to an amortization table. We've got the $100,000 bond initially, less the unamortized discount of $7,722, giving us a net book value for the debt of $92,278. After the next payment where we amortized $772 of discount, the unamortized discount remaining would only be $6,949, causing the carrying value to increase to $93,050. And this process would continue, obviously, period after period. And so at maturity, the $100,000 would be all that's left in the amortization table, the discount being fully amortized. On the balance sheet at any particular date, in this case at the end of 2000X3, we'll show the bonds payable of $100,000 less the unamortized discount, now a contra account to the bond payable account for the net book value of the debt, $96,000 here. The income statement for that year would report interest expense of $95,44. That's two six-month periods. That's a full year at $47.72 per six-month period. 